And welcome back to the Five Factors Podcast. I am Tal Prince here along with my intrepid co-host, Matthew Adair. Matt, how are you? Good. I don't know what intrepid means, but uh, I'm doing well. So thank and, you for asking. This is my mission is to increase your vocabulary. Uh, anything that I can do. Uh, we'll link that up in the show notes for the rest of the universe that doesn't know what that word means either. Absolutely right. Um, and, and happy to do so. So just expanding vocabulary across the globe. So uh, happy to help with that. So, um, so you've had a good week, I'm guessing. Yeah, doing well. I mean, you know, kind of in the just in the, the heart of uh, football season, both uh, professional and college and flag football for my two youngest boys, oh, uh, which is man. the most important one for me. All right. So um, describe your passion and feeling for football because you, of, of all the guys that I know, you are the footballiest of all of them. Uh, so, so describe how, how football, uh, what, what feelings it brings up for you. Well, uh, it, it brings me a lot of joy. Now that happens to be for a large part because I'm a fan of the University of Alabama and we don't lose a lot right now. Now I've been a fan long enough to remember seasons of, you know, nine loss seasons, you know, it's, it's not great, but. And some uh, of us were, stretch, were long for the return of those days. Yes. The, the last decade has been uh, fun, but you know, before that, you know, my, my father-in-law is a high school football coach uh, in Birmingham Mm -hmm. uh, and have had the opportunity just to see, I think the, the benefit of, of how that sport really does help, uh, develop young men and, uh, and it's fun. And, uh, my wife loves football, so I don't have to fight that battle on the weekends about mm -hmm. whether I get to watch any football. She's going to be watching it as well. Um, so it's kind of a big deal for all of our family. Well, almost all of our family, my oldest son uh, does not like football. Uh, but that just means he kind of gets to do his own thing, which makes him happier than anything in the world. Well, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, it's something that you are, I, I, I've known since I've known you, you are very passionate about football. Um, you know, so I just wanted to ask about that. Well, and, uh, and, and by passionate, uh, I try very hard to not be that fan, you know, um, and to be that guy. Uh, and, and since you are an LSU fan and I'm an Alabama fan and we're mm -hmm. friends, I think that I have, uh, been able to successfully navigate that. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I yeah, would give pat, you credit pat for myself that. on the back. I would give you credit for that. Um, you. you know, so yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, I'm also not like a rabid person about it either. I'm like, yeah, do we lose? No, oh, okay. Um, you know, I'm a soccer person that is different. So, yes. <laughs> so talk to me after a soccer loss. It's, it may not be as good. Especially uh, since half of your matches end in a tie. So wins and losses really aren't that important. You know, listen, um, and it's because we appreciate strategy. We appreciate making every game matter this way. Um, and, and it is a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing. We, it doesn't have to end in a win or a loss. Points are awarded. Um, and, and it all goes into, you know, I mean, maybe we just do math better, which is frightening um, a prospect for me. Because math and I do not get along um, in any stretch. I mean, you're the world's worst accountant, but it's only because I didn't try it's it. True. <laughs> it's only because i never tried that uh but anyway we're here to talk about the five factors and uh so it's a good idea to uh just kind of go back to the start of that and and kind of recap the framework of that uh so that our, our listeners uh, understand what we're talking about when we talk about five factors so matt you want to take a, a run at that yeah, so as we're starting this podcast, and this is episode six, and what we're really doing in these first episodes is giving you an overview of this uh, framework for leadership uh, that we really believe is built around five very critical areas of health. So when we talk about the five factors, we're talking about areas like mental health, physical health, relational health, spiritual health, and vocational health. Mm -hmm. And we believe that when leaders invest in those areas, that they, uh, they become healthy. And when they're healthy, then you see things come out in the life of a leader, like resilience and strength, relational presence, hope and ambition. And so this is a different way to think about leadership. It's not uh, simply built around character and competency, as valuable as those things are. It's really trying to say that uh, if you want to thrive as a leader, if you want mm -hmm. to be in the game for the long haul, if you want to be faithful, if you want to leave the right kind of legacy, then you need to lay a foundation of health. And we believe that these five factors, if you pay attention and invest in these areas, you're going to have the best opportunity possible to thrive as a leader. 
I think a lot of us fall for the lie that talent's enough. Yeah. And um, I, I think that everybody at some point in time uh, runs into a wall. Here's the way I would say it. Mm. Nobody is undefeated as a leader. <laughs> That's good. So at some point in time, the task of leadership is going to beat you down. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so how do you continue to grow and develop? And so nobody has just enough sheer talent to be able to manage the complexities of being a broken person in a broken world, leading broken people. And so, you know, one of the areas that I think we really see this show up in is in the relationships that leaders have with other people. Matter of Mm -hmm. fact, it's probably the surprising thing that when I look back on my 20 years of being a, uh, an organizational leader that um, I don't feel like I was told, or maybe I just didn't hear, maybe it wasn't (laughs) listening. uh, Probably the, the latter two, um, the importance and the critical um, relationship that um, presence has uh, in our mm-hmm. life as a leader. It's not just simply about having clarity of vision. It's not just simply about being able to communicate well to a large group of people. It really comes down mm-hmm. to your relationships. And so what we're going to talk about in this episode is the importance of presence in our relationship, mm-hmm. family, friendships, things of that nature. And so Tal, you wrote an article a little while back on uh, relational health uh, Mm -hmm. and you can go to fivefactors.net slash presence and you can go and take a look at that article. Would really encourage you to do that. Really helpful. But um, just maybe break the article down a little bit, Tal, and what's the real heart and soul of what you were trying to communicate when you wrote that? You know, really, I think what I see a lot in my, in my own life, but also in my practice as a therapist, is that there is just a, a high degree of men, particularly, um, who are really, they just don't understand what presence really means. Um, it sounds kind of like some new agey, uh, weird thing, like live in the now, be in the moment, you know, and you hear those phrases and sadly from a lot in my profession, um, that they're well intended, but we're not defining that. And, and so people just kind of, um, they're around, but they're distracted. They're physically present, but they're not mentally, spiritually, emotionally present in a, you know, in any discussion, any event, any, uh, any gathering, they're just, you know, so we're so distracted distracted um, as a people. So really in that article, I'm trying to teach uh, leaders how to be present with themselves first. (laughs) Yeah. You know, just to like what what's going on with me right now? Am, am I fully aware? Uh, you know, so to give them an idea of how to be present with themselves, so that they can then be present, uh, you know, with their family, with their friends, with their followers, uh, and so just kind of trying to give some concrete tools uh, with how to begin that process. And one of the things that's interesting to me in reading the article is, is that you were talking about relational health and being present in your relationships, but you were also talking about self-awareness and, and a lot of emotional intelligence, a lot of the areas that we talk about in mental health uh, and the need for resilience as well. So again, these cross over and mm-hmm. they interconnect and interweave with, with each other. Um, when, uh, when you think about the challenge of somebody being relationally present, what is the single most critical factor for them beyond just that sense of self-awareness? Uh, what do you tend uh, to see missing? Uh, if somebody's scratching and clawing, growing in self-awareness, but they're not quite there yet in their relationships, what's that next hurdle that they maybe have to climb and clear in order to get closer towards being present in their relationships? You know, I, it's a great question. I think overall, it's going to come down to can you can you shut out the distractions? It's just having internal boundaries of can I shut out the distractions of the world? Can I shut out the distractions of what happened at the office? Can I shut out the distraction of, geez, I got a problem with, you know, such and such staff member? Or can I shut out the distraction of this electronic device that is attached to me at all the times? And it's always beeping and it's always buzzing uh, and it's always trying to draw my attention away. Um, You know, I mean, I find that leaders have an incredible lack of ability when they're, when they're at their unhealthiest, they have a lack of ability to unplug. Mm. 
and they and and it becomes this um it, 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 it's very much like quicksand where uh, so the answer is uh, you know things aren't going well so the answer is i got to work harder um and, and so they're trying to answer every bell and and put out every fire when the answer may be to be still uh, um, it, it, the answer may be Psalm 46. The, the, the answer may be to step back, be still, stop digging the hole that you're in because you're the one that's creating the instability in it. Um, it's hard, but I think that's really what goes on. Yeah. So when, when you have that ministry couple in your office as a licensed therapist and there is a desire for both of them, uh, let's make that assumption that they both, they, they want uh, to be closer. They want a better relationship in general uh, from the ministry leader side. Would you say that it's that sense of uh, distraction and the inability to unplug that is usually um, the, the driver for why they can't connect well? Well, they're going to have, I mean, they're having issues. Uh, and so the, the, the deal is it's kind of chicken or the egg, which, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is it, but it's usually, you know, they're bringing, they're each bringing in internal issues. They're bringing in dysfunction because Genesis three is still in the Bible. So they're bringing dysfunction into the session. Um, and one of them is just going to try and survive the hour. Okay. And I hear this all the time and I wrote about it in the article. There's going to come a point where the onslaught gets so heavy. Uh, the temperature rises and the conflict gets so hot that the one who's just trying to survive is eventually going to say, look, I'm here. What else do you want from me? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you're physically here, but you're not participating in this um, because you, you've got internal wounding, you've got internal dysfunction, you're just trying to get through it. And so that's why outside of my office, the distractions are so appealing. Right. Let's say you're the pastor and, and you've got you know, trouble at home. Fact is, is most, an overwhelming majority of ministry spouses wish their spouses would choose a new line of work. They don't like it. Yeah, talk more about that because, you know, if that's true, then we've got ministry leaders that are listening in and um, either that's resonating with them or uh, their ears should perk up and uh, wonder if they're talking to their spouse about um, how they feel about being in ministry. Yeah, and I think that's a very important conversation to have because it is uh, ministry spouses are really, really lonely. If you think it's lonely being the pastor, being the lead guy, Try being this. Try being the lead guy's wife, um, because you know there is this desire to connect. There is this desire for relationship. Yet you can't really have it because <laughs> because you can't really be in an open relationship. Because if you're if if you're too transparent, if you're true too vulnerable, well, then that information is going to get out and get, and, and, and get run around. And, and then the pastor may be up for a vote on Sunday or, you know, things start to deteriorate um, and, and you lose your base, you lose your support of the people. And, you know, it's because, you know, your spouse had some things to say, you know, because you had an argument over coffee this morning, um, it, you know, and so there's very few places for the, for the minister's spouse to vent to, uh, and we all need to do that. Uh, we all need to be able to do that. Um, I, I never understood, my dad was in auto parts, and I never understood the, the company he worked for. They had an anti-nepotism policy, which I thought was ridiculous because I thought they should hand me a job and pay me lots of money. Of course. No skills or talent with cars whatsoever. Um, you know, and I was like, what? This is a stupid thing. Why do they have this? And so my dad, my dad said, listen, it comes down to this. Everybody has a right to whine and moan. All right. And if you're walking around the halls and they know you're my son, they can't do that. And they have a right to complain about how I'm doing things and they have a right to complain about how things are going in the company. But if you're walking around, they fear it's going to get back to me. And so I can't have you there. And that made perfect sense. Um, You know, but so, but the challenge is the minister's wife is there. And 
more often than not, she's feeling a bit of trapped or stuck. Um, yeah. Unless you've cultivated a network, uh, you know, a support network and created that, which I find critically important, unless that's there, it, it's a lonely, lonely place. Yeah, it's one of the things that probably doesn't get discussed enough. And I'm, I'm thankful for, I know the, the denomination that I'm a part of in the PCA, I mean, has a, has a um, intentional ministry for pastor's wives mm. to connect with other pastor's wives. And, and it does have an element of older um, women, younger women, which I think is helpful. Um, I know that I see it a lot with church planters, um, that the assumption is that we're going to be different. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and I think it really does come back to that. I mean, I think one of the things that can happen um, for the the spouse of a pastor is that um, people, uh, there isn't the relational depth because people aren't going to be completely honest um, for one of two reasons. Either they have things that they struggle with in the church, mm-hmm. um, or there's this sense that um, we've created within leadership that it's it's not okay to criticize the pastor. The pastor right. is God's man, God's person. Oh, yes. Uh, and so there is that, you know, kind of what your dad was talking about. Then, then you have this gap between reality um, mm-hmm. and what's being presented in the relationship. Right. And so um, that can happen. And I've seen uh, examples uh, of that time and time again of um, spouses that have mm-hmm. relationships, friendships with people in the church, and then they leave the church. And they, they never told, they never said a single word about it until they were uh, out the door. And right. uh, that's really, really challenging. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think that that, for me, when I think about the uh, the critical element of it, what I hear you saying uh, as it relates to leaders and their wives, uh, leaders and their husbands, is the presenting issues of being distracted and being physically mm-hmm. present, but not relationally present. Like, you've got to go deeper. Uh, Mm -hmm. you have to, you can't just look at the surface issues and go, that's really the problem. It's just a matter of you putting your phone away. Like there's a reason why you can't disconnect from the phone. And those are the conversations that need to be had together. And then when it seems like you get stuck, then they need to go find a a good counselor to sit down with and really have somebody else help them walk through that. Yeah, because it just becomes part of the dysfunctional dance that every couple has. Right. Um, you know, and I don't know what everybody's specific dance steps are. Everybody's got their own kind of unique take on it and how their dysfunction partners with their with their spouse's dysfunction and how they begin to create this dance. But very often for ministers, it's, um, you know, the, the spouse begins to build a fair amount of resentment. Um, and that's that's very often largely based on, Okay, so when you're at church, you're somebody different than we see here at home. Mm. And that's a problem. And so now the the minister is like not happy with this confrontation. And so right. any call is preferable to this discussion. Yeah. Any text is preferable right. to this discussion. Any spam email about something you don't need, say a five factors tourniquet, um, you know, email rolls in and there you are. Anything is preferable to the discomfort of this discussion about maybe your shortcomings. And, and so if somebody calls and says, oh, you know, pastor, you know, our son was just in an accident or he was just arrested. And, you know, and so you're very willing to leave the house because you were looking for any reason to get out of there. Right. But this has this, this you get to cloak in nobility and ministry yeah. and I'm doing God's work, honey. How dare you stand in the way, um, you know, of me doing God's work. This is what I've been called to do. Um, and so that is where, you know, a ministry couple, usually they come in to see me once it gets too difficult there, right. um, you know, because there's just so many things. And so it's very hard for the minister to come home, the leader to come home and want to be present. Yeah. Um, because you've been dealing with stuff all day. And you, so you're, you're not looking to come home and deal with deep stuff. You're looking to come home and unplug and unwind and, and all that. But, you know, if you are not checking um, how everybody's doing at home and you're not checking in on that and you're not giving enough time to them. Um, I mean, it, it's going to go badly. I mean, this is why every airplane you've ever been on, they tell you to put on your oxygen mask first before you try and help others. Yeah. If you are not present for your family first, you are not going to be present in a full way for the people uh, that you're tasked with shepherding. You're just not. Right. I mean, obviously we've been talking a lot about marriage here, but it's true in parenting and it's true for our kids as well. I mean, uh, I think when we think about um, 
the stories that we know mm -hmm. of ministry leaders and their kids, um, most of them are not great stories. I mean, that's why I'm grateful for the ones that you do hear that stand out. Uh, I think about uh, Ray Ortland, who's a mentor to me and mm -hmm. uh, a man who's in his sixties talking about his father, who's been with Jesus now for more than a few years. But so this is not a younger guy who lacks self-awareness or, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, over the years to be able to look back on the legacy of his father and say, yes, he was a fantastic man of God who loved the church, mm -hmm. but he loved me uh, in ways that were both gentle and tough. And, uh, and so I'm thankful for those stories because we just, uh, we hear a lot of stories historically about mm -hmm. uh, great men of God, quote unquote, um, who mm -hmm. were not very good parents. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, l let's maybe help the ministry leader who wants to do a good job at home with, with their kids. And there are books written on this and everything like this, but if you were to break it down to one simple thing, that a ministry leader can do to ensure that they are prioritizing um, their life at home with their spouse, with their kids, what's one thing that they could do this next week uh, that would help them to be able to make that investment in the people that should matter most to them? You know, I, and, and this is going to sound really cold, um, probably, but I, you have to put it on your calendar. Yeah. You just do. You you have to book appointments with your family so that you have uh, on your calendar undisturbable time. Yeah. Um, because if you don't have it on there and somebody calls you and asks, hey, can we grab a quick cup of coffee? Can we do, you know, you're just looking for a window where there's no ink. Right. And if you're not paying attention, and this takes presence, if you're not paying attention to that, you're, you're going to lose that. I think, um, you know, I, I don't remember what book it was in, um, but I remember reading you know, a statement from Andy Stanley on leadership about he told uh, the people at North Point that I'm going to be the best pastor to you I can be in 40 hours a week. And he stuck to that, um, you know, where I like, no, here to, you get 40 hours a week, man. And, and other than that, that's, that's it. And if you can be uh, the type of leader who pays attention to a clock like that, I think that's a fantastic gift to give to your family that you, that you protect that time and put boundaries around that time um, and come home, shut your phone off, you know, or at least put it in another room. Um, you know, I mean, I think one of the, one of the most interesting things I've ever watched is, um, a, a bunch of patients in rehab because they, they take your phone from you. Um, you know, so they take all the devices from you and, and, and I, and, you know, still when I'm speaking at rehab centers around the country, um, I watch patients that I'm speaking to, I watch them reach for their back pocket or their hip pocket, uh, because they're feeling phantom vibrations. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, it's like the, it's like someone who gets amputated, gets a leg amputated and they feel phantom pain. They feel phantom vibrations. They're sure their phone is, is no, there's a notification that they got to check. Right. Um, and, and it's not there. And so we, we need to get away from those devices and those screens, turn the TV off, turn your devices off, spend intentional time with the family. Um, and, and part of that starts with knowing how you feel yourself. What's going on with you? What, how are you feeling right now? Um, and in that article, you know, we, we put out the tool of the feelings wheel, um, right. which is just one of my favorite things. And the one I put in there is it's, it's got on, on the left half, it's for when your needs are not being met and on the right side, when your needs are being met and look uh, how you're feeling. And that, that's going to clue you in probably to the fact that, oh, geez, I don't think my needs are being met. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and so that's, that's a, that's a great barometer. It's a great compass point for you to go, oh, okay, so what do I need right now? Uh, you know, what, what am I lacking that I, that I feel that I need? What am, you know, what's going on with me? Or, hey, wow, my needs are being met and that leads to gratitude. And then that, and, and so then you can share your feelings with your family. You can, I, I recommend you all just, I'm telling you, if you'll give your kids these, give your spouses these and just sit down and have discussions about, hey, how's everybody feeling? Um, and, and drive them to use the tool. The emotional intelligence is going to increase in the family. It's just going 
going to. And you're giving your kids an incredible gift uh, of giving them a feelings vocabulary. Um, and so you're starting emotional intelligence in, in them very, very early. It's far more useful than the algebra they're learning at school. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a key point and it gives you things to talk about because, geez, what, what's your response if one of your kids comes to you and says, yeah, well, I'm feeling really sad today. Um, well, you're going to, if you have a heart, you're going to drop everything and sit down and, and, and probe and find out what's going on. And, yeah. And, and those conversations are incredibly meaningful. And if you, and, and I recommend, um, and it's hard, man, it is hard, but I recommend that we as leaders, that we, that we take our kids out individually, that we take them out and spend time with them. Um, Cause most of us have more than one, you know, or a lot of us do anyway. And, and so it's, you know, take them out individually and, and do things with them. And, and, you know, one of the easiest things to do, um, I got this from our mutual friend, um, Emery Langston Haygood. Um, but he would, he said, look, take your daughters out on a date. Take them to Starbucks. They love to go to Starbucks and they do. <laughs> it doesn't have to be Starbucks. Any coffee shop of your choosing, if you support local, fine, do you. Um, you know, go do that. But sit in, a, sit in a coffee shop, buy them a hot chocolate or whatever coffee drink they want and sit down with them and ask them this question. Hey, so tell me what it's like being you. If you have daughters, they will talk for an hour. Um, they are going to run with that. And you're going to learn a lot about them, uh, and you and you've been present with them, and they've and they've vented, and they get a lot of stuff out in that conversation. And so those are things that are really simple tools. But I mean, the, the difficulty and complexity comes in how do I work this into my calendar? Yeah. Uh, but you have to put it on your calendar, or it absolutely will not happen. Well, and I think the principle underneath all that is you cannot always be available. And mm -hmm. uh, I know some of the reasons why ministers have come to believe that. And I think they're inherently flawed. Mm -hmm. The idea that you are always on call um, right. turns you into uh, the triune God for people. Right. It also, uh, dis it really doesn't help your people because there's only one of you. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're far better off saying, this is when I'm available. I'm working this many hours a week. Uh, I'm, I, I, you can reach me here to here. Mm -hmm. The first time I had to go um, into counseling and I had to go because I had just gotten fired from my first ministry job. Mm -hmm. And I call um, and to set up a meeting with our mutual friend, Elang <laughs> and, uh And I was told that he could see me in two and a half weeks. Now, I was in an existential crisis. Yes, you My were. entire world was falling apart. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, I kind of mumbled, okay. Then I got mad. Then I called mm -hmm. back and asked to talk to Langston. Now, Langston knew what was going on. Um, and so when he picked up and we had a conversation and the message was really simple. This didn't happen overnight. It's not going to get fixed overnight. I'll see you in two and a half weeks. I love you. Jesus loves you more. See you later. <laughs> We have got to quit right. thinking that we are the Holy Spirit for people. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is, number one, um, you are prioritizing other people over your family. Number mm -hmm. two, you really aren't prioritizing other people. You're most likely just using ministry as a crutch mm -hmm. for what's going on inside your own head and heart. So please mm -hmm. don't do that. Yeah. And that's why there are so many ministries across the country for, uh, for pastors' kids. Yeah. Um, it is, so, it is a difficult, difficult place for them uh, to grow up in. And as a, and I, you know, I, I get the same stuff as a, as a counselor, you know, people are calling and their lives come apart and I got to, I got to get in today. You know what? That's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, there's only so many hours in the day right. and I can't get you in and no, I'm not staying uh, beyond the work day. Right. Um, and, and I say the same things to people all the time. This problem did not start this morning. Yeah. Um, and it's going to take a lot longer than one hour with me to fix it. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, this is when your appointment is. Yeah. Um, and other than that, here's the crisis line. 
Yep. Um, you know, here's, here's, here's the crisis line or dial 911. And that doesn't mean we don't show up for genuine emergencies, but they have to be genuine emergencies. And we right. have to quit thinking that any blip in somebody's, you know, radar uh, mm -hmm. is an emergency in which we have to be, you know, all hands on deck through that entire process. Uh, yeah, that will suck a, the life out of you. And it will just basically push your family off to the side. Uh, yeah. And it, it, it sheds light on, I think one of the bigger issues that we have as, as ministry leaders is that we very often, and I see this over and over and over is we create by nature um, and default sometimes a very codependent dynamic where we want our people to depend upon us. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Yeah. If your people are depending upon you, where's their faith? Yeah. Their, well, their faith's in you. And the, the subtle seduction of that, of, you know what? These people trust me. These people look to me. These people need me. And that feels like job security. Right. Um, and it's not, um, no. but it feels like a warm blanket of security and it's none of that. And so you creating a system uh, by which they will wear you out. Uh, and so, and, and, and I only know this because I absolutely did this as a pastor. I created a very codependent system. Um, and then I began to resent the tar out of everybody that I had taught to depend on me. Mm, yeah. And I'm feeling exhausted and I'm like, can these people ever give me a break? And, you know, but I'm the one who created that system and taught them to depend on me and not on God. I, I taught them to depend on me, not community. I taught them to depend on me, not, not others in their lives, yeah. um, you know, that, that God wants to use to meet their needs. And so I wanted them all to depend on me. I resented the crap out of them and was furious at them. And so how can I love them uh, now when I'm angry at them? And then right. at home, I've got the dynamic of, guess what? My whole family resents the church too um, because they're always calling and they won't leave me alone. And so, and, and they see me complaining about them when I hang up the phone, I'm like, yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, I, if she can't get through an hour alone, I don't know what her deal is. And so then yeah. my family goes, Oh geez, she's a weak one and she's nuts. And, um, and you know, and how are they going to love that woman? Well, right. Um, you know, or that man, well, how are they? And, and I'm dealing with addicts all the time, you know, I mean, how are they going to love these, these, these people? Well, um, um, because they don't see, they see me resenting them and not loving them. Uh, and so they feel like they've got a license to, to not love them, but they've got an extra issue because I don't have time for them because I'm dealing with these people that I've taught to depend on me. And, yeah. you know, and it's just a vicious cycle um, and nobody's happy. Right. Um, and it's exhausting. Yeah. So I think you have to embrace your limits as one person and you have to intentionally make room for your family. I want to change perspectives and talk a yeah. little bit about friendship. Um, uh, shout out to everybody who um, uh, believes that their uh, spouse is their, both their best friend and the only friend that they need. Um, <laughs> I, uh, 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 you and I are coming from a different perspective. I think we would both uh, say humbly and by God's grace, we have healthy relationships uh, with our wives and would consider mm -hmm. them to, to have elements of friendship to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to talk about the importance of friendships beyond your spouse. Uh, I think we would both look at the landscape for leaders and go, there, there are a lot of leaders that don't have any friends at all. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of leaders that have, uh, quote unquote friends. Uh, I want to talk for just a minute about some of the specifics, maybe a, a couple of things that we can point out that go, if you're really looking to cultivate a healthy friendship, these are some of the things that need to be there. One for me is this, uh, a little while back, I preached, uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 19 to 25. And there's that, mm -hmm. um, idea of stirring up affections and, and it's, uh, the better translation is spur. Like there is an mm. irritation that happens. And one of the things that I brought out in that sermon is the best friendships irritate you in your blind spots. They care enough about you mm -hmm. to assume the best about you. They mm -hmm. know that you're trying to do your best, but they're going to ask you about that. And I think that's the mark of, uh, of a genuine friendship. We won't get into the story. I've told in other places about your and my friendship about that kind of, it started there. It started with that kind of spurring and that willing to poke at something that I couldn't see about myself. 
So mm-hmm. beyond that, what, you know, maybe one or two other things that if somebody's going to cultivate a healthy relationship where there's going to be good relational presence and it's going to be beneficial for both people, what needs to happen in that relationship? <laughs> Quite simply, there needs to be vulnerability brought into the relationship, and that's hard. Yeah. That's really, really difficult uh, to say, I'm going to give this person permission to absolutely cut me to the core. Right. Um, And I'm going to trust that they're doing that because they love me. Yeah. Um, That's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's frightening for a lot of us who have insecurity. It's frightening for um, those of us who are, uh, tend to be perfectionistic. Um, and I, I want to encourage all of us to not fall for the tired cliche of leadership is lonely. Yeah. Um, that's something that we say to excuse the fact that we're too afraid to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think leadership has to be lonely. I think it is lonely, but it doesn't right. have to be. Um, I, and I'm, I'm a guy who has a really hard time for most of my life taking any uh, negative feedback. Um, I, I couldn't take it for most of my life. Um, and I didn't learn how to take it until I went to rehab. That's when I learned. Um, <laughs> One, because, you know, if you're in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, at any point in your life, you know you've taken a drastically wrong turn. Um, Shout out to Southern Miss. How are you doing, guys? Um, so, I mean, but, well, you know, if, if, if you're in the part of Hattiesburg that I was uh, for 45 days, you know you have taken a desperately wrong turn in life. But um, one of the great tools I learned there, and it was only because it was a rule, um, is that no one was allowed to respond to any negative feedback for 24 hours. Hmm. And I want to tell you of the freedom of that. It allowed me to just sit there because I know the person giving me feedback is not expecting a response. I know they know I'm not allowed to give them one other than right. thank you. Um, and that frees them up to be a, to, to be a little bit more open, honest, and direct, which they Yeah, because a lot of the reason that people don't, give us feedback is because they're, they're afraid of the backlash. Right. They're terrified because if, if, if you're anybody like I was, um, you know, if you gave me any negative feedback, any thing that I construed as possibly negative, I quickly had to correct your perception. Oh, well you misunderstood. Let me fix that for you. Yeah. Let me clarify Um, for you. Yeah. Let me clarify for you why I'm still right. And, um, and you're, you never are. Um, and so that, and, and then sit in my chair and wonder why I don't have as many friends, right? Yeah. (laughs) Because who doesn't want to be friend with the perfect guy? Um, you know, and so I created this weird trap for myself and that, but, um, I, I didn't learn to take negative criticism and feedback until I sat in a chair one day and this one man, I mean, I want to tell you when I say this guy absolutely verbally cut me to the bone, Mm. um, that is an understatement. And he absolutely just devastated me with the things that he said, but I wasn't allowed to respond. And so there was, my wheels weren't turning as to what I needed to say. Yeah. I actually listened to what he had to say. I thanked him for his feedback and then decided to myself, I hate that guy. Yeah. And he hates me and we'll never be friends and we'll just get through treatment together and I'll never see him again. Right. Until we left group and went to the lunch hall and he went through and got all his food Um, and I had sat down and then he came and sat right next to me and that absolutely blew my mind and I was mad that he sat next to me. Mm. Um, but he sat down next to me and we had the same tone of conversation that we'd had earlier in the morning before he gave me any feedback, just kind of, you know, everything was fine. Yeah. Because the relationship was not the stakes of the feedback. Right. Yeah. It was, hey, look, I'm trying to help you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm revealing a blind spot to you. 
And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying this is what I'm seeing. You evaluate that over the next 24 hours and see if that fits or not. Yeah. Um, and if you want to come back to me in 24 hours and say something about that or re, you know, have a discussion about it, I'm happy to do so. Um, and it started with a very simple respect of him asking me, hey, are you open for feedback? Yeah. It's kind of and a critical then, component too, right? Yeah, because you, you can go rush and then, hey, let me give you some feedback right quick. Um, and they're not ready for it. Um, and, it, you know, but so that's a really powerful thing. And that guy and I, uh, we still talk. It's been years since I was in rehab. And we talk nearly, I mean, we're in constant contact with each other. Yeah. And I know that guy loves me. Right. You know, because he, the relationship was never the stakes of any conversation. No, we're in relationship. This is something I need to share with you. Yeah. Um, and he made me better. God used him to reveal a blind spot to me. And that made me a better man. Right. And, and, and so I think that's, that's really what we're after here. I mean, it's, it's if you're going to cultivate these kind of relationships, and it probably has to start with us, if we just sit around waiting for that kind of person to walk into our life, um, uh, we're probably going to be waiting a long time. So we have to go and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you want a friend, be a friend. I know that's an old cliche, but here what we mean intentionally is some of the things that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. um, being uh, willing to be vulnerable, uh, being willing to um, assume the best of other people, but then go have mm -hmm. that hard conversation. I remember, uh, again, going back to Ray Ortland, uh, he said, you know that you are vulnerable in your relationships when um, you are willing to expose weaknesses and when you are willing to own up to things that could get you fired. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's the I bar, y'all. I mean, uh, and <laughs> I remember uh, hearing that the first time and going, whoo, man, that's a steep climb. But I think you hear that and you know that that's yeah. inherently right. And so, you know, as, as you're listening to this with us, and again, the, the imagery that we have is the two of us kind of sitting across from each other and then you joining us. And mm -hmm. um, if I'm hearing this, I'm thinking about, okay, so family and friends getting focused on that and going, how do I cultivate the kind of presence that I want to have in those relationships in order for those relationships to thrive? Um, because those relationships are critical. Mm -hmm. in your ministry. You need your family and you need friends, but it has mm -hmm. to start not only with your physical presence, which may be the, the starting place, you mm -hmm. creating a calendar where you're like, I'm only working these hours. And when you go home and the things that are going to cause you, tempt you to work, uh, your devices, those things go away. You know, you're going to spend uh, time intentionally with the people mm -hmm. that matter most to you those simple basic steps. And again, we're big believers in incremental change. If this is an mm -hmm. area of struggle for you in any of those things, we're not expecting you to get done listening to a mm -hmm. podcast and be like, okay, great. It's done. No, you have to put in the work now, but the work is taking that next step. If you're working mm -hmm. too much, what's the next step you need to take to work less? If you're at home physically, but you're not there mentally, emotionally, what are the things you can do next? Again, you go into the show notes and there are tons of resources there, feelings wheel, books, different things mm -hmm. we've referenced, Tal's article that you can go to again at fivefactors.net slash presence. And you can go and you can get the resources you need to take those right size steps in order for you to create the kind of change you need in your life so that you can thrive not only in your leadership, but in your life. And in the end, that's really what we care about. So again, when we put all this together, we come back and talk about relational health. We see how it impacts every single other area. We talked about the relationship with mental health and emotional intelligence, but it absolutely has an impact. If things are bad at home, um, then don't be surprised if you have struggles uh, uh, sleeping, mm -hmm. you're stress eating, um, you're either exercising mm -hmm. too much or too little. Um, your life with God is off kilter because you don't actually have a grasp on who you really are. One of the mm -hmm. best ways for us to cultivate an attitude of repentance and a posture of repentance in our life is the help of other people showing us things we need to mm -hmm. repent of. Mm -hmm. And so you mm -hmm. need that there. And then it's going to absolutely carry over into your work because that feeling of loneliness and isolation that I see in so many people that I feel in seasons in my own life is because I'm not cultivating those relationships that really don't have anything to do with ministry that they really are uh, about my family that's going to be there for a long time and friendship, which by its very definition mm -hmm. isn't contingent upon um, you being in a particular job or whatever. 
And, um, and so I think there's just a ton of carryover and crossover there. So Tal, again, your article is helpful. Your experience is helpful in this. Any kind of last words you'd want to share um, as we wrap this episode up? I just think what you said is, is perfect in terms of this is incremental. This is not going to just poof happen. Um, and the thing, I think if, if I could get you to take one incremental step today, it would be grab that feelings wheel and start to use that until you are aware of how you are feeling and what is all going on inside you emotionally at any given moment, it's really hard to be present for others. Um, and so this is like a, this is the, the launch pad right here. Um, and it's hard, I know. And, and, you know, a lot of men are like, hey, man, I don't, you know, so for our male listeners, I get it. This is not your favorite thing. Um, but, if we're here to change and grow, maybe we need to do something a little bit differently uh, than we've been doing it. And so this is a this is a simple thing to start changing. It's not easy, but it's simple. It's like playing the blues. It's simple. It's not yeah. always easy. Yeah, um, I mean, we're huge on simplicity, but uh, never, ever, ever, ever will you probably hear us say something like, "This is simple and easy." No, nope, it's simple and hard as hell. Yeah, exactly. And so get this thing, get this tool, download it, use it. Check in with yourself five to seven times a day. Hey, I'm just going to use this. I'm going to sit down with it five, six, seven times a day. Ask myself, how am I feeling right now? Um, and look at those words and see which ones start to click with you. Um, and then just kind of keep a running tab on that. Um, and when you're ready, add another person to that. Um, add your spouse, add a, a close friend and go, Hey, listen, I'm trying this out. Can I check in with you uh, a couple of times a day to let you know how I'm feeling? And man, I invite you to do the same, um, you know, try this tool and start to do that with me. Um, and as you check in with each other emotionally, uh, you will be amazed at, at how quickly your relationship begins to grow a whole lot deeper. Yeah, it's absolutely and, true. So start there. And so, uh, again, I think if you're just completely overwhelmed by everything that we're saying today, because you're, you know, you're, <laughs> we're saying a lot. Um, and so, if you need clear next steps, get into the show notes. All the resources are there. Go to fivefactors.net. You're going to see an opportunity. If you want to kind of see how this fits into the big picture of how you thrive as a leader, if you want to see how this fits into the big picture of what we call the five factors leadership framework, then it's real simple. Go to fivefactors.net. There's an opportunity for you to download our free overview. It's going to show you not only how all these things fit together, it's also going to give you an opportunity to take a quick 10 minute self-assessment. So you can just right now go based on where I am now and how I'm answering these questions for myself, how healthy am I? Because we believe that your health is the foundation for your leadership. Mm -hmm. That if you're mm -hmm. healthy, you have the best opportunity possible to continue to thrive as a leader. And if you're stuck as a leader, my guess is your first move is to go back to ground zero and to focus on yourself first uh, mm -hmm. and to see where you need uh, to shore up your own life. Mm -hmm. And then that will enable you to be able to kind of take it to the next level as a leader. So Tal, as always, good to see you. Um, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Again, grateful for uh, everybody who's listening to this, excited to get this thing started and uh, look forward to seeing you on next week's episode.